Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the On Device Research UK Guide to Retail Marketing Effectiveness. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Gibbs, and I'm going to be spending the next half an hour or so talking you through some of the key trends uh, to affect the retail marketing sector in the UK at the moment. Um, I will particularly be placing uh, these trends in the context of digital marketing effectiveness, how digital can be used to help retail brands grow in these challenging times, and specifically how we can measure the effectiveness of our marketing. And we'll be drawing on a couple of uh, data sources today as we take you through this presentation, um, one of which is a survey that we conducted uh, earlier this year in April. Um, it was a survey of 500 UK smartphone owners as we assessed their attitudes and behaviours around um, retail in the UK, both online and offline. Um, and we'll also be delving into some insights from our ad effectiveness database. We've tested over 350 uh, digital ads um, in the UK over the last few years. And we'll be pulling out some retail specific um, insight into the, the brand impact of digital. Now, to start with, um, let's have a look at some of the uh, headlines which have grabbed the attention of the retail sector in the last year. Um, you know, I guess the, the narrative in retail a few years ago was very much around um, the growth of the discount supermarkets. You know, there's a lot of talk about the squeezed middle, so people were showing an increased propensity to, to look for bargains and Lidl and Aldi. They'd, uh, they'd do sort of luxury top-ups in the so-called posture supermarket, Waitrose and M&S, and Sainsbury's and Tesco and Asda were very much getting squeezed accordingly. Now, I, this narrative has sort of um, evolved over the last year. I think we've very much seen, you know, the discount has continued to grow, particularly as Brexit fears heighten. We've seen the, the pound weaken. We've seen the cost of food imports increase. So consumers are naturally looking uh, to make their, you know, make their weekly food budget stretch even further, which has certainly played into the hands of the discounters. This, of course, happens against the backdrop um, of continual challenges on the high street. So, of course, barely a day goes by when we don't hear of another uh, closure of a, you know, well-known high street brand, or at the very least, um, a major sort of high street brand announcing a number of store closures. Of course, this in turn has very much been driven by, I suppose, the likelihood of consumers or uh, the propensity of consumers to, to shop online. Uh, there's obviously no surprises there. But you know, one of the key uh, online uh, sort of shopping trends over the last year has very much been this growth in direct to consumer models. Um, we'll talk a little, we'll put some sort of specific numbers around this as we progress through the presentation. But of course, you know, we have seen this growth in brands marketing themselves um, directly to consumers and um, cutting out uh, third party retailers and online retailers. For some reason, uh, this very much seems to be the preserve of mattress and razor brands, um, although, and, and it is very much the sort of activity that you might associate with digital startup. That said, you know, major FMCU brands are getting in on the act now as well. We've seen Unilever um, plot its own sort of direct to consumer moves, and there's you know, rumors of Mars doing the same thing. Um, but of course, you know, uh, well, while I said we will put some figures against this direct consumer um, trend later in the presentation, there is no uh, denying that the vast majority of online um, shopping uh, is obviously going through uh, the channel that is Amazon. Um, so, of course, Amazon have, you know, placed some severe competitive pressure on the retail and grocery sector over the last year. Um, they've obviously bought Whole Foods um, in, in the US. Um, there is, you know, there are rumours they're going to buy Morrison's over here. We've obviously seen that they are already have a deal to provide Morrison's food deliveries to UK customers. Um, but of course, naturally, um, it, it, if Amazon gets to uh, apply its sort of supply chain expertise and buy power to the grocery sector, it does sort of um, represent quite a profound um, disruption to traditional retailers and traditional grocers. And this is, of course, probably no small part, um, some of the reason why we have seen the biggest supermarket merger in decades announced in, uh, in May, um, with talk of um, Sainsbury's and Asda obviously joining forces. Our research has suggested that actually you know, roughly half of Sainsbury's shoppers have not shopped in Asda in the last three months, and roughly half of Asda shoppers have not shopped in Sainsbury's, indicating that there is you know, a significant opportunity for growth in the customer base of the new combined entity of Sainsbury's and Asda. 
Um, furthermore, um, you know, slightly different data source. Obviously, that's self-reported data we're looking at. Um, location sciences, the geolocation data expert, um, uh, suggest that 25% of shoppers can actually be found at both supermarkets. Obviously, slightly different data sets, but either way, it is pointing to um, room for significant, significant growth in the customer base, this new uh, grocery entity. Now, you know, you could position these, uh, these headlines as threats for retailers. You could obviously position them as significant opportunities as well. And we'll discuss some of those as we progress through this presentation. But I think one of the things that we'll be discussing is, you know, it does present significant opportunities for brands to differentiate themselves, to, um, um, to increase the mental and physical availability that consumers have for them. And we're going to be talking about how digital marketing um, can be used to build brands. But I think before we do that, it is worth reminding ourselves of some of, I guess, the framework in which we think about digital brand measurement online. So, of course, you know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with Byron Sharp. He seems to be, he seems to be the core text um, on the mouths of marketeers at the moment. Well, Byron Sharp, Sharp talks about how brands grow and he talks about brands growing in two ways. So he talks about brands growing by building both mental availability and by building physical availability. The mental availability is, of course, um, whether your brand is thought about in buying situations and is built to above the line advertising and marketing. Every retailer, they need to think about how they can use um, offline and online channels to build mental availability um, for their brand. Of course, at the same time, if you want your brand to grow, you need to build physical availability. So this describes the ease at which consumers can purchase your products online and in-store or purchase from you um, online and in-store. If you look at the traditional purchase funnel, of course, you know, considerations about mental availability very much play into uh, top of funnel metrics. So around awareness, perhaps seeping into consideration metrics as well. And of course, the world of physical availability very much relates to the world of driving purchase and sales, of course. Now, it's crucial if we to understand um, how uh, retail brands can grow, and particularly how they can apply digital to their growth. Um, it, it's crucial that we obviously measure digital correctly, but there are a number of issues that we should address with the measurement um, of marketing effectiveness in the digital space for retailers. Um, just a few challenges here. I mean, I think the measurement of effectiveness is very much focused on the short term at the moment rather than the long term. Um, the, the digital ad industry is still very obsessed with behavioural metrics, um, still very obsessed with measuring click-through rates, which tell us very little about brand impact, which tells very little about sales and ROI. Um, it's suggested that chief marketing officers have some of the lowest tenure in the boardroom at the moment. And that very much plays into this trend for seeking short-term rewards at the expense of long-term growth. Another issue is, quite frankly, you know, achieving ad cut-through is hard. We live in a world of fragmented consumer attention. Uh, people talk about consumers having continuous partial attention now um, as, their, as, as, as their eyeballs are kind of spread across numerous devices and platforms. So, you know, what it takes to create um, a sort of memorable and effective ad um, has changed them in the digital landscape. And then finally, we have to acknowledge that, you know, while digital is fairly well geared up to tracking ad exposure or linking ad exposure to online sales, it's, uh, it's not quite so effective at, at linking ad exposure to in-store um, purchases or a physical um, footfall. And we'll discuss um, some of those methodologies and findings later as well. So that's broadly the framework that we will consider when we talk about how we measure um, the effectiveness of digital marketing for, marketing for retailers. But why, you know, while we acknowledge that mental availability is important and that physical availability is important, let's have a look at what some of the key disruptors are um, to both mental and physical availability at the moment. So um, our survey of 500 UK and um, smartphone owners um, has suggested that, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, digital absolutely dominates consumer attention now. So in this chart on the left hand side, we're looking at the proportion of UK adults um, which are consuming these media, these media um, at least uh, once a day. So as you can see, 88% of our sample says they're using the mobile internet at least once a day, closely followed by mobile apps, 87%. Um, and as you'll see, actually, you know, and it's, sort of, it's, it's this place where we start to see traditional uh, media seeping in. So we've got linear TV channel viewing, 68% of our sample um, are 
are watching linear TV at least once a day. Um, see, it obviously comes as no surprise that digital con uh, uh, you know, um, could command consumer attention these days. I think you know, we do need to be careful when we talk about the death of TV. TV is far from dead. The TV set is still as important and as, as dominant a device for watching um, on-demand TV, certainly, um, as it ever has been. So we actually conducted this survey last year, and we can see that in 2017, 51% of our samples said that they watched on-demand TV um, by their TV set. That's actually grown quite significantly this year to 67%. Um, the integration of um, on-demand TV into existing subscription TV packages, the growth of um, Amazon Fire Sticks and Chromecast, them all um, created a far more seamless integration between on-demand TV and the TV set. Uh, for short online video clips, however, which also really dominate consumer attention in third place, 72 percent um, watching short, line, short online video clips at least once a day, pretty much synonymous with YouTube, of course. Um, the mobile device very much dominates this, and 72% claiming the the mobile to watch short online video clips. Now, of course, as we all know, you know, it tends to be that where consumer attention goes, where consumer eyeballs go, the ad, ad spend tends to follow, which is why, of course, we see significant growth in digital ad spend specifically um, across the market, and specifically from retailers over the last few years. Um, this has enabled us to test the, the brand effectiveness um, of digital retail ads, and in fact, um, we have pulled out the results from 60 retail um, digital campaigns, had a look at average brand impact across them, and you can see the average benchmarks we see here. So, on average, um, uh, we found that digital retail ads drive a 9.1 um, percentage point uplift in unprompted brand awareness. So this is, an, this is an uplift between people who haven't seen digital advertising and people who have. It's a classic control versus exposed ad set. And as you can see, you know, it, digital is having an impact throughout the branding funnel. It's having uh, an impact on top of mind awareness, on ad recall, brand consideration, and purchase intent. You know, it's easier to move the dial on top of funnel metrics, you know, getting people to notice digital retail ads, but you are still having significant impact at the bottom of the branding funnel as well. You know, that 1.9% uplift or delta uplift in purchase intent essentially equates to a finding that on average, an additional 90 people per thousand claim that they're likely to make a purchase from a retailer following campaign exposure. So digital can have a very significant impact on brand metrics. So that's a description, sort of, you know, a summary of disruption to mental availability. Um, if we look at disruptions to physical availability, well, the retail on mobile is now a significant purchase activity for consumers. Uh, we've asked consumers what they've purchased by their mobile phone in the past three months. Again, the chart on the left-hand side we're looking at here. Most commonly, clothes and footwear. Um, obviously, the rise of brand, you know, apps like ASOS massively contribute to this trend. But we actually see that 29% um, of our sample are buying groceries on mobile. Um, they're very... You know, the, the majority of major UK supermarkets um, have online delivery services. They have um, um, apps associated with those services, of course. Not all of them do. We'll talk about that later. But that obviously no small part um, plays into this trend for propensity towards grocery shopping on mobile. And I suppose it disrupts traditional, um, traditional um, uh, uh, sort of channels such as I suppose, physical shopping as well. Um, now, I think it's also worth pointing out that even when people aren't making purchases um, via, uh, via mobile, people are still showrooming. In other words, they are taking their smartphone into retail stores, into supermarkets, and they're doing things like checking prices, reading product reviews. In fact, we can see that 55% of our samples say they use their phone to check prices. 30% use it to read product reviews when in store. So showrooming is very much um, a trend, even if people aren't executing that final purchase on mobile. So it still plays a very important role in the path of purchase. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, so we've talked about the fact that uh, direct consumer um, is a uh, you know is a growing trend. Um, you know, 20. We've asked our, our, our sort of survey. We, we've asked them where the first place they go is when they go um, shopping online. 23% say they, the first place they go is to a brand's website directly. 
which obviously very much plays into the direct consumer model. Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, with the likes of Unilever getting involved, they essentially very much become sort of frenemies of the retailers now. The retailers have to stop their products, but at the same time, um, they're competing with them and they are eroding their margins for products that are being sold directly. And we'll have a look at some of the motivations um, behind direct consumer purchases later on. What we can't ignore, however, is that the vast majority of consumers don't go direct to brands' websites, even though it's still important. 68% um, say they go to third-party sites like Amazon or eBay, first of all, when shopping online. And again, we'll delve into this trend a little bit more later in this presentation. Um, I've just seen a question has popped up. I will just take, I'll probably just reserve questions till the end. Um, I'll cover it off then, and if, um, if people are too shy to ask me questions, I'll leave my email address as well. I think one thing that is very important to acknowledge when we're talking about the growth uh, in uh, mobile uh, sort of shopping for groceries is actually, as the, um, as the ONS report, 82% of retail sales still happen in store. They still happen offline. Um, that is why it's so important for us to passively measure digital ad exposure and see if we can link that to actual store visits. And actually, um, on device research, we partner with our uh, geolocation data provider, Location Sciences, and we are, um, we're able to do just that, track people from ad exposure to visits to known retail store locations. And actually, we've, um, we look at, I suppose, the average across around 20 um, store uplift studies that we have tested. We have seen an average uplift of 14.2% in terms of football following campaign exposure. Of course, this varies by category, varies by um, whether it's a frequent or sort of infrequent retail store visit. But there is a significant role that digital can play in driving people in the store. What we're going to do now, though, now that we've had, had that sort of broad brushstroke look at the disruptors to mental and physical availability, we're actually going to focus in now on some of the UK's top supermarkets, some of the top grocers, and have a look at how they specifically are impacted by some of these trends. So there's a lot to look at on this chart. So um, if we just um, work our way through it step by step. Um, what we're looking at here on this chart are people who have shopped at these various supermarkets in the last month. Now, along the horizontal axis, we've plotted those who are the percentage of what, who watch linear TV less often than once a day. So the further along this axis you are to the right, the less likely your audience are to be consuming TV, which we're using as a, pro uh, as a proxy, I suppose, for traditional media. On the vertical axis, we're looking at the percentage of these various supermarket brands, uh, shoppers, who have bought groceries with a mobile device in the last three months. So the, the horizontal axis essentially represents disruption to mental availability. In other words, they're less likely to be consuming um, traditional channels like TV. Um, then you have to find consumers. If you want to raise your mental availability, you have to be advertising on less traditional channels, digital, mobile. Um, the vertical axis represents disruption to physical availability. If your audience are more likely to be on mobile, then it represents, I suppose, a disruption to traditional paths to purchase, such as physical in-store purchases. It's interesting to note that those in the top quadrant, those who are, I suppose, facing the most disruption for mental and physical availability, are Marks and Spencer and Sainsbury's. Uh, Marks and Spencer are actually, you know, overridingly uh, at the top of that quadrant. So it, its shoppers are the least likely to be watching TV and the most likely to be buying groceries on mobile. Um, it's telling actually that, I suppose Marks and Spencer, you know, obviously has quite a different proposition um, to the rest of this, um, the re to the rest of these shoppers. Um, its audience, I suppose its audience are looking for a slightly different thing when it comes to food shopping. They, Marks and Spencer have said themselves, that their audience, that they're, I suppose they're more really competing with Deliveroo. They have an audience seeking almost instant gratification, um, sort of uh, on-demand meals, which are perhaps a bit of a luxury. And they are actually trialling um, home delivery of their um, of their ready meal services in Camden, um, which will be interesting to see what the results of that look like. So they are very much sort of exploring this idea and you know playing into their audiences. Um, propensity towards mobile shopping. It's worth saying though, you know, obviously all retailers will find it increasingly hard to reach consumers through traditional channels. Um, and I suppose everyone has to think about the need state that consumers are in when they need to, um, you know, when they are engaging with grocery shopping um, in, 
phosphates. We've also had a look at which um, brands are under the most threat from direct-to-consumer, uh, direct-to-consumer models. So we've looked at the percentage of supermarkets and monthly shoppers um, who, um, when shopping online, go to a brand's website, first of all. I mean, there isn't a massive difference in the range. I mean, it's 21% at the lower end and 25% at the top end. It is interesting to note that Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer shoppers are more likely to go direct to consumer, however, um, and therefore, you know, perhaps that is more disruption from direct to consumer brands. Um, I think, you know, as we see more major FMCG brands get in on the act, you know, there's rumours that Mars will be joining Unilever. It'll be interesting to see how um, retailers start to differentiate their offering. Because we've actually asked people, you know, what is the reason that you go directly to a consumer's website? Um, as you can see here, I mean, the motivations for shopping directly to a brand's website, um, a lot of it is around brand relationships. So 37% of um, um, our respondents claim that they just trust the brand's website more. Um, also, 30% claim it's just because they're a fan of the brand. There is, a, you know, there is a sense of brand engagement, being a fan of the brand, as it were. But also, you know, there's a, lot, a large proportion of respondents who claim that it's about looking for exclusive offers. There's also, you know, people looking for safer product guarantees. I think that, um, you know, one thing that retailers probably have to consider as this trend grows is, okay, you know, do we try and sort of um, confront the direct consumer brands? at what they're best at. You know, retailers are among some of the most trusted household names. Should they try and leverage their trust uh, when trying to win back consumers from direct consumer brands? Or do actually they play at the bottom of this and really just differentiate themselves and actually say, fine, you know, you go to direct consumer for exclusive offers and product guarantees, but we will give you lower prices, convenience, better customer services. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Those are two slightly different strategies that retailers have and grocers. Um, I guess, you know, the, the whole point in direct-to-consumer is that um, it does allow brands to develop much more personal relationships with their audience and from personal relationships derive far more valuable and meaningful first-party data, which is, I think, more important than ever before in the post-GDPR world. Um, uh, a more sophisticated application of first-party data throughout the marketing cycle creates a virtuous circle which only um, improves the planning of marketing, um, the optimization of marketing, and I guess the measurement um, of marketing. And actually, you know, there's this nice quote from a consultant from this raconteur article, which really sums things up quite neatly in terms of you know, first party data sticking at the heart of direct consumer. So it says that once the consumer has downloaded the company's app or logged into a website, the entire experience takes place in a digital wall garden and can be highly personalized. And as the company gains more data, and learns to serve the consumer better, it creates a virtuous circle, which makes it, which makes it harder for a competitive challenge the role of the incumbent company. So again, you know, if this is, if this is one of the benefits of direct consumer, um, uh, people, uh, retailers need to think about how I suppose they can amp up their own first party data. Of course, you know, many of them are experts in doing this through their own, their own multi-card schemes and increasingly through their, um, their app solutions as well. But um, it is very much what sits at the heart of direct consumer success stories. I mean, what, what we can't deny, however, is that um, you know, if you move away from the direct consumer model, as we've said, you know, the majority of consumers are actually going to third-party sites like Amazon or eBay first of all when they're shopping online. And actually, of course, Amazon and particular and eBay are are also experts in that leveraging first party data. I think what's particularly interesting is to see whether Amazon actually followed through on this idea of developing a free ad supported um, version of Prime Video um, this year. So lots of rumors swirling around this. And I think, you know, if they do, then we are left in a, we're, you know, we are, we are in a place where Amazon are not only sort of becoming increasingly dominant at the bottom end of the purchase funnel, increasingly dominant in, um, I suppose, commanding and influencing physical availability for brands, but also because they become an app platform, um, they become dominant in leveraging mental availability for brands. I mean, their ad business is obviously growing exponentially. It grew by 60% in the first quarter of this year. It amounts to $2.2 billion globally. Um, you know, you can imagine a world where 
uh, where Amazon starts to dominate the entire purchase funnel for brands and does so very effectively. Um, if you also consider that 21 to 27 percent of our samples say they're looking at their mobile phone information related to TV ads, you know, Amazon potentially starts to sort of influence this second screening sort of interplay as well. So um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how this pans out. And of course, as we've seen with Amazon starting to, you know, if it's so into the grocery sector, it does, it will start to place significant competitive pressure on the traditional grocers as well. Um, we just looked in this chart here, we're looking at the percentage of supermarket monthly shoppers who claim to have used a grocery home delivery service in the last month. So this is used, they've used any grocery home delivery service, um, not necessarily the home delivery service of their, uh, of their supermarket of choice. So for example, 56% of Asda shoppers have used any sort of grocery home delivery service in the last month. Um, I think it's quite interesting that um, actually, it, it's the top and the bottom of the market which um, don't really offer these services. Little Aldi and Marks and Spencer don't really offer a home delivery grocery service. There's lots of rumours that Little are about to do so, um, and we've obviously heard about you know Marks and Spencer experimenting with um, its ready meal delivery, but it's not a wholesale rollout of food delivery. I think you know if M and S and Aldi do decide to get into this space, they probably need to consider. That, you know, the higher proportion of their audience who have bought groceries on mobile in the last three months. You know, their, 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 um, their grocery and online shopping um, user experience should be very much focused around mobile, very much focused around app. We've, um, we've also asked people, uh, respondents, you know, what the key considerations are when buying groceries online for home delivery. You know, what, you know, what is the motivate your home grocery? Um, your, your grocery home delivery decision making process. You know, unsurprisingly, as always, it's about price, low delivery charges, product prices. Um, but you know, product range is also important. I think the availability of specific delivery time slots are quite a functional thing, quite a functional consideration is very important. Um, I think you know, this chart is just, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's worth retailers considering if they're, if they're devoting all their sort of um, development or that developing into the lower end of this chart, ability to spend vouchers, customized delivery slots, ability to track my shopping, you know, perhaps you should consider refocusing their efforts on the upper end of this chart, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that people will always search for lower prices in this, um, in this sector. Um, we've also had a look at, I suppose, you know, we, we, when we talked about digital effectiveness earlier, we were primarily talking about I suppose digital display advertising, um, but it's worth talking about other forms of um, digital marketing. Um, in the vertical axis here, we have had a look at respondents who claim they always skip ads in online video. Um, obviously, you know there is an irritation factor with online video when it comes to pre-roll advertising. Um, you know, M and M and S's audience are the least likely to do so. Lidl's audience, however, are the most likely to skip with online ads. It's also quite interesting, therefore, if you look at the horizontal axis, that Lidl's audience are also the most trusting when it comes to product recommendations for social media influencers. So obviously, you know, um, influencer marketing, absolutely, you know, absolutely burgeoning trend. Kendall Jenner makes a whopping $1 million per product endorsement. And uh, while I'm not necessarily suggesting that um, all these supermarkets go out, rush out and work with Kendall Jenner, um, it is off, it's obviously a channel worth considering. I mean, it would be interesting, it's hard to know whether there's an element of dog wag sale here. I mean, Lidl have been working very successfully with celebrity mum Heidi Klum over the last couple of years in terms of the influence base, which could be one of the reasons why their audience is so trusting of product recommendations and social media influencers. But, you know, it's perhaps worth, um, it, it's worth other brands considering, considering you know, um, working in this space. Aldi's audience is the second most likely to be skipping video ads. Should they be thinking about other are the routes to raising mental availability for their brands amongst consumers? Should they be exploring the influence opportunity as much as little? And to be fair, most of these brands are exploring to some extent. So, you know, now that we've had a look, I suppose, some of these key disruptors to mental availability and physical availability, how, um, I suppose, this plays into some grosses specifically, um, 
we should ask ourselves the question, okay, well, how do retailers actually maximize marketing effectiveness, effectiveness in the face of all this digital disruption? What does it take to make an effective digital ad to drive levels of awareness or consideration or purchase? We've actually conducted some work on our ad impact database. Um, as I mentioned, that consists of over 350 digital brand studies. We've had a look at the relationship between emotion and purchase intent. So we've had a look at whether ads um, drive a positive emotional reaction following exposure. We've also had a look at how likely they are to drive an uplift in purchase intent. As you can see, there's, there's broadly quite a, there's quite, you know, quite a significant linear trend between the two. You drive positive emotion, you're more likely to have an impact on purchase. The entertainment category, the tech and consumer brands are really good at leveraging this relationship between emotion and purchase. Um, I mean, if we think about tech, it's all about um, appealing to emotion when it comes to sort of high involvement purchases, particularly if you look at the likes of Apple and Samsung. Um, entertainment, of course, you know, if you think about the creative that uh, movie releases you know, have, have to play with, you know, they've got highly engaging video content to play with, of course, they're going to be able to sort of tick this emotional box more readily than other brands. Finance, unfortunately, a fairly dry subject isn't very good at sort of getting our hearts racing and appears at the bottom of the spectrum. But retail appears pretty much bang on trend, but in the middle. And I think it's very clear that you know, retailers, if they really want to drive further purchase in their digital creative, they should look to raise levels of emotional response to their advertising, um, try and get the blood racing, as it were. So there is this positive link. Um, and this is something, you know, this really goes back to basic sort of marketing um, behavioral theory. If you look at Daniel Kahneman's book around behavior, a behavior system one and system two you know he will t he will tell us that brands which deploy um i suppose emotion in their creative for brand building will drive far more richer uh, long-term growth benefits uh, than than those um, which don't which only derive short-term growth benefits the formats which are best for driving emotion so here so here we can see that actually the video um outperforms interstitials and banners in terms of um, emotional response so creative format does have an impact. And we know that on top of that, that actually, you know, the top emotional quartile drives uh, on average a 5.1 percentage increase in purchase intent, whereas the bottom emotional quartile, in, terms, in other words, the brands which have no emotional impact, don't turn to have any impact at all on purchase intent. In fact, have a very marginally negative impact on purchase intent. So emotion is key and video drives emotion. Um, last year, we also released um, a paper on um, digital um, creative best practice. This is available for download on the On Device Research blog. Um, so I'd encourage you to go there and download it if you're interested. Um, essentially, we sort of um, it was a meta-analysis again of our ad effectiveness database and it had a look at the commonalities um, in the most effective um, ads. I mean, and there is a list of ten um, guiding principles. Some of these may sound blindingly obvious, but you'd be amazed. At how frequently brands don't adhere to these principles. We actually found that the top performing ads, so the top 20% of ads, on average adhere to six of these principles. So at least six of these principles. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take you through all of them now. I mean, of course, you will all have this deck distributed afterwards. I was just going to take you through a, through, um, a, through, um, through a few of them, um, those which have particular relevance to the retail sector. Again, it may sound obvious, but logo presence on every frame is crucial for retailers. You'd be amazed at how many times people launch a digital ad where they've only got their logo on the first frame or the final frame. You know, like it or not, people just aren't paying enough attention um, uh, to digital advertising. Perhaps two, three seconds. We need to be hitting them with the brand logo as much as possible. 88% um, of the top um, of the top 20% um, of ad, um, in terms of ad recall of the digital ad have a logo presence in every frame versus just 67% of the bottom um, quintile. And here's just an example from Selfridges. It's a video ad, the Selfridges logo is omnipresent. Doesn't matter if you look at this ad for one second or 20 seconds, you always know it's for Selfridges. Um, product shots are key. Again, it may sound obvious, but if you want someone to buy something, show them what you want them to buy. Um, I mean, retail is pretty good at this normally, but we've tested plenty of ads that people haven't done. 91% of the top 20% of ads in terms of purchase intent um, contain a product shot, but only 75% of the bottom, bottom 20% do. A logo at the top of a creative really helps a brand stay top of mind. Um, um, eye tracking studies show that people's eyes generally tend to wander to the top of a creative to begin with. 
Um, so mobile creatives that contain the brand logo at the top of the ad rather than the bottom will come to mind first. It's worth saying, bearing in mind that this M&S ad here, the original is the one on the left-hand side with the logo at the top and the sort of dummy bird from the right-hand side just to illustrate the difference in what we need. But the, you've got it at the top, you, you know, you're going to drive larger levels of ad recall. Um, I think this is, quite, uh, this is quite an important consideration for the retail sector. Um, I think for, for many reasons, you will often get dual branded creative um, in the retail sector. Um, you know, it tends to be a product plus a retailer. Um, we, we tend to find actually that if you look at the bottom 20% of ads in terms of ad recall, dual branded creative tends to be over-representative there. I think there's a sense consumers often get distracted and confused by dual, um, dual branded creative. Now, of course, you know, this is not to say let's just bin off dual branded creative altogether. Sometimes it's naturally imperative in this sector. So, you know, a further analysis of this suggests that if you do employ dual branding, there are a couple of other considerations, a couple of the boxes you make sure you've got to tick. And that is, we tend to find that use of human presence you know, a focused product shot, and also 100% logo presence that focuses on one of the two brands actually tends to reduce confusion. So by all means, have dual branding on the final frame, on the first frame, but just make sure that there is one brand which is more prominent than the others. Keep a human presence in there to engage, keep a product shot, and that will give your dual branded creative, you know, a fighting chance um, of appearing um, higher in the ad recall rate. I think it's also really important to acknowledge the, um, the, the interplay between brand activity and direct response activity. So lots of debate in the industry about what is the optimal split between brand and direct response, sales oriented activity versus you know, true emotion driving brand activity. Um, the sort of seminal IPA paper from Peter Field and Les Binet suggests suggest that the optimum split between brand and you know, short term activity is 60-40 percent of budget on brand, 40 percent on more sales driven activity. You know, we've actually tested, and this is for, um, so these are actual results, but we've, um, we have removed uh, the metric and we've removed the advertiser. But for one client, we have tested um, what happens when respondents are exposed to just brand activity and they achieve a 4.3 percentage point uplift in a key brand metric. Those who are exposed just to the sales activity only um, achieve a 0.5% increase in the brand metric. And actually, those who are exposed to both the brand and the trade only achieve a 2.5%. So actually, you know, while the sales um, creative may be great at driving short-term response, you know, it's kind of buy one, get one free deal-based advertising, too much direct response advertising can have a depressive effect on brand, um, it, you know, brand perception. You know, if you're out there and you're talking about value offers the whole time, it will have impact on consumers' uh, perception, for example, around quality and value. So it is worth brand testing, you know, where your tipping point is between um, brand impact, between brand um, and direct response activity. So look, um, just a final couple of slides before I'm going to take some questions. We like to think that there is, um, you know, we, we, I think the most important thing to do with marketing effectiveness is to develop a framework which will enable you to develop a sort of KPI scorecard for digital on a quarterly basis and produce benchmarks which you can use for planning your next course of work of activity. Now, we like to call this framework on device research. We like to call it return on brand impact. It essentially starts talking about brand results um, in sort of real financial terms. It's sort of step down the funnel before you start talking about actual hard ROI. That's a metric by which marketing effectiveness should be optimized. There are a number of inputs into return on brand impact, not least of which are brand studies, so looking at your uplift and purchase intent, for example. But if you apply that figure to your campaign reach data, you can figure out how many incremental purchases of your brand you've driven. And if you apply that to campaign spend data, you can start to calculate some broad return on brand impact figures. As you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, we've actually looked at um, just a sample of 10 FMCG campaigns. We've calculated their average unit price of the products being sold, uh, which is £5.91. We looked at um, the number of incremental consumers purchases driven by the campaigns we tested. Um, and we found that actually it costs £1.38 on average to make one additional person say that they were likely to purchase the brand. 
Now, we've made a fairly crude assumption that each person then purchases at least one unit of that product, but it at least gives us a feeling, a maximum value of campaign return and impact, um, and that, that ceiling allows us to test, iterate, and optimize future activity, and suggest an average return on brand impact of £4.28. So for every pound spent, we're getting a return of £4.28 on average across these 10 categories. And you know, we would encourage you, the work that we do with advertisers to apply these reach, spend, and uplift figures um, to this framework to come up with a more coherent and holistic sense um, of brand measurement. So um, that's it from me. Um, so, you know, the five key takeaways from today um, that is obviously the retailers face severe disruption to traditional channels used to speak to consumers. You know, only 60% or 68% of watching linear TV channels on a daily basis, but it's 80 to 88% using the mobile internet. We've obviously seen um, ad dollars and ad spend follow, follow consumer eyeballs, but you know, I think there are still plenty of brands out there who um, need to get their measurement in place rather than just sort of um, paying and spraying, as it were, um, in the digital ecosystem. But we know that digital has proven to be highly effective brand building medium. You know, it drives up this in awareness of you know over nine percent, up this in purchasing sense nearly two percent. It's an effective medium, but measurement needs to be put in place accordingly. Um, in terms of physical disruption, you know, we know that consumers, an increasing amount of consumers, are buying groceries on mobile. Um, but you know, not just that, the digital obviously drives significant um, offline activity as well. And you know, most sales, you know, we need, we need to remember, do still happen offline, and digital can drive footfall uplifts so about. 14.2%. Um, and just a reminder, that's quite an interesting solution we use there. It's a combination of passive ad tracking data from on-device research, and we combine that with geolocation data from our location partner, Location Sciences. In terms of some of the key retailers, um, Marks & Spencer faces some of the most digital disruption um, of all the grocery re retailers. It's shoppers, the least likely watching TV, the most likely buying groceries on mobile, and also, you know, I like to be going directly to, to brands um, websites online when making purchases. I think you know, direct consumer activity is still a minority activity, but you know, it is an increasing and very real competitive pressure. Um, Sainsbury's and MS shoppers are the most likely to direct to brands and websites directly. But ultimately, you know, we do have to consider the growth and strength of Amazon um, in, in, the, in, in the online ecosystem, uh, particularly as they ramp up their ad business and start to have influence both on brands' mental availability and their physical availability. So look guys, thanks very much for your time. I think we'll now move on to um, the Q&A. Um, this slide here, I'll distribute this afterwards just to give a sense of um, all the um, insights and data solutions on device research have throughout the planning cycle. We have research solutions to help you plan more effective media, optimize the delivery of your media uh, in campaign, and also measure the effectiveness of digital across platform campaigns in terms of online and offline attribution. So I'm just going to bring up the question panel, if you'll just bear with me. So one question I've had is, does mobile include tablet, or is this purely based on smartphone consumption? So actually, it, it depends on the question. Um, in our, when we're looking at uh, media consumption uses, the frequency of media consumption, we um, we were only asking about mobile, smartphone, and smartphone apps, so that won't have included tablets. Um, when we've asked about people's propensity to shop on mobile devices, so that 29% of people who grocery shop online are on mobile, that will be tablet and smartphone. Um, so there is a distinction there, um, and it's it, it, it's a, it's an important question, and um, I'll actually I'll make sure to highlight that on the slides when we distribute these. Um, do we have any more questions from any, any attendees? So we've got one more here. So the question is, would supermarket online stats be affected by the level of online presence? Not all brands offer delivery, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think absolutely. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, you've got the likes of, um, you know, just because a brand doesn't have, um, uh, an online delivery service, it doesn't necessarily mean there is an appetite from its audience. We've seen that M&S and it was Aldi, their audiences are the most likely to buy groceries on mobile, yet neither of those brands 
have much of an online presence or a home delivery service. I think Aldi's got an app which gives you discounts. It drives offline store activity. It's clearly got an audience which has a thirst um, for online shopping. So, you know, I think it will be a factor, but I think, you know, just because someone doesn't offer a mobile solution, it doesn't mean there isn't demand there from their audience. Do we have any more questions? Any more questions from, um, from our participants? Well, look, guys, thanks very much for your time. Um, I've left my email address here. Please do get in touch um, if you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to look at any more customized cuts to this data. We've obviously looked at quite top line level. We can look at different audiences if you're interested. If you'd like to learn more about ad measurement, also get in touch. Um, this deck will be distributed after this call. But in the meantime, um, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for your time.